from a transport perspective, how, I mean, starting with you, Andy, how do yeah. you feel like it's gone as Mayor of Greater Manchester? Um, well, for honest, it's difficult. Um, I wouldn't, I think, be being honest if I sat here and said, oh, yes, we're making all of these improvements and transport is getting better. I, I don't think I can say that. Um, it's the biggest problem we face, if we're honest. And a lot of our time, you know, part of our time has been spent dealing with the chaos that came with the timetable change last year, which rumbles on. Uh, we then have the kind of never-ending debate about HS2 and Northern Powerhouse Rail, as important as that is. I suppose where I kind of come to two years in is, even if we got all those big projects, it isn't going to make transport better here in the next 15 to 20 years. And we've got to make sure that the debate is not, you know, you don't solve the North if you give us a certain configuration of HS2 and Northern Powerhouse Rail at Piccadilly and Manchester Airport. You, you have to uh, do that, yes, in the long run, but you have to have a plan for the short and the medium term as well. And that is about listening to the National Infrastructure Commission calling for devolved powers and funding mm. to city regions like ours to start to integrate our system into a London-style system. So, Jessica, to answer your question, two years in, I feel very clear now about what we need. And what we need is devolved control of the whole thing so that we can integrate it, uh, we can put a daily cap on what people can spend, and therefore you create an incentive for people to use public transport, but to do so in a different way than they currently do. Mm -hmm. So a bit of a bus journey here, a, a Metrolink there, a train somewhere else, and you create that London-style public transport system. So two years in, I would say, I'm now getting clearer about what it is we need in the next 10 to 15 uh, years. And it's a question of now going out there and, and getting that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Steve, what do you need uh, in the Liverpool City region? Well, the first thing is, because we're in Manchester, I can't miss the opportunity to say... To I'm praise Manchester City. Well, I'm concentrating really on connectivity to Madrid, Andy, to tell you the <laughs> truth, um, <laughs> over the next few weeks. Um, <laughs> what what we're, we're both trying to do is, in our own areas, the intra-city um, sort of stuff that we're... Uh, responsible for is to look at exponential improvements year by year on all of that sort of stuff but I think one of your panels just been talking about how does that connect then to the intra-city stuff and how do you make it the integrated transport system that we all want and obviously in, in our area we've got the other complication of ferries and we've got tunnels and we've, you know there's all sorts of stuff and we've made huge progress but um, is it enough? Is it exactly what we would do if we had all of the powers available to us? If, for instance, is it what we'd do if the piece of legislation, the Bus Services Act 2017, wasn't so bloody complicated to try and navigate around and to try and see whether we can um, use that as a tool in our armory that we can start to pull those different things together? Probably not, but what we've been dealt with we are desperately trying to um, see whether we can uh, improve the experience for passengers in the Liverpool City region, whilst as a backdrop to this, the bit that falls outside of our remit, the stuff that's happened on Northern, um, short forming, um, the fact that some of these services are still as appalling as they were months and months ago, um, that's a real frustration because we want more control over that. Do you feel you have a productive relationship with um, the Department for Transport and Chris Grayling? Well, it was certainly difficult last year. Um, and it's not necessarily about the current Secretary of State. I just think Northern Transport has been an afterthought for all Secretaries of State and always for the Department for Transport. So last year kind of brought that out, didn't it? And I think if there's one thing I think we can say we've definitely achieved together, which is we've put... Northern transport higher up the political agenda than it than it was before. I think we can. I think we would both say yeah. We definitely feel we've uh, we've done that. Um, and you know, obviously, we've got things. The fallout of last year is potentially opening up the opportunity for us, though, isn't it? Um, the Williams review is coming along. Uh, Steve hinted at it just a moment ago. We will be making an argument for GM Rail. So just so everyone knows that we will be arguing for devolved control of the GM commuter rail system. Because this is where I'm coming to in terms of what I said before. Next month, I want to sort of put out what, what might, you might call the, 
uh, the GM equivalent of the London tube map. On the zonal system we now have for Metrolink, I want to start showing uh, you know, how a, a reformed bus system sits on top of that, how a GM rail system sits on top of that, how Chris Boardman's B network and bike hire sits on top of that. Do you see what I mean? So that you can start to create a picture of a multimodal system that has a daily cap uh, that is integrated as a whole. That, I think, is where we are. And I think, I didn't hear his speech today, but I think the Secretary of State is talking in similar terms. You know, we did find it, it was difficult last year, but I think coming through it, he and I started the year talking about the potential for tram train, for instance. So if you start to integrate Metrolink with the overland uh, commuter rail system, you start to come up with quicker solutions to some of the capacity problems on the rail system in, in central Manchester, which would obviously present a solution to the north more broadly because the, the congestion here is causing delays to rail services everywhere. So I think increasingly there's a sort of sense of agreement, I think, about where city regions need to go. And I think it's as simple as we need a London-style system. Because if you leave it as it is, where people pay for rail separately from bus, from Metrolink, the cost of public transport can be much higher here than it is in London. And consequently, people have a much stronger incentive to just get in their car, because actually, it might take them a long time. They may sit in some traffic jams, but they'll probably get there in a time frame that they would kind of be able to plan for. Uh, and it would be cheaper, probably, than doing multiple journeys on different modes of public transport. That is basically the problem, and I think there's increasingly a shared understanding that the big cities need something different outside of London. Thank you. Uh, and Steve, you've got a, a £6 billion uh, station plan that you talked about at MIPIM this yeah. year. Um, what's an update on that, and how does that align with you know, the conversation about HS2 and Northern Powerhouse Rail? I, I believe in trying to be as frank as you possibly can, and, and the bit that we've done fairly poorly in the Liverpool City region over many years is that we haven't looked far enough ahead. So we, we look at electoral cycles, for instance, uh, too often. And we need to think strategically and long term about what the needs of a 21st century Liverpool City region will be. And that's why we've got a station commission. It's headed up um, by um, somebody that I think both of us have lots of faith in, him for his football allegiance, me because she happens to be a brilliant chief executive of Everton Football Club, um, Denise um, Barrett-Baxendale, and she's pulling a team around here so that when um, there's a, an opportunity, whether through this government or a, a future different type of government, whenever they say there's some infrastructure money, that we are ready to access that pot of money and we've lost out, in, in all honesty, we've lost out to the likes of Greater Manchester in the past. Um, we should have had a tram system by now. Mm -hmm. And we didn't because we didn't get our act together for a whole host of different reasons. But it is a huge omission for an international city of some you know, repute of uh, Liverpool status and stature that we haven't got a tram system. And that's because we didn't plan, we didn't come together. We've got this opportunity now with a combined authority we are working together. Six districts have never, ever worked together, only over the last two years. Um, we're working with the Department of Transport, and that was your question to Andy about um, working with them, and we are. Um, I don't know whether Chris, when he was here before, uh, I don't know whether he's from Athens, but sometimes you'd have to be aware of Greeks bearing gifts because he mentioned to the, um, the uh, assembled audience about the offer of us having responsibility and having um, the enclosed network, the major rail network, devolved over to us. Mm -hmm. um, but it depends where liabilities mm -hmm. sit. And sometimes you have to carry out the due diligence, and if it's the right thing for us, working with the unions and everybody else, then we'll get that deal over the line. But um, the departments, if, I think if they were offering this to somebody down south, there would be a bursary with it, and we're basically told you can have that or don't have it. Mm -hmm. Um, and Andy, uh, in terms of GM Rail that you've mentioned uh, and aligning uh, things like the bus plan, I mean, how would that work in terms of current franchises and operators? So, so this is um, uh, the, the journey that Greater Manchester has got to go on. Um, it's about reforming the way the system works, so it works as a, as a coherent whole across the modes. So as Steve said, we've got the Bus Services Act 2017, we're currently looking at our options under, under the Act. Um, 
my point of view is what, what, it's what you need first, isn't it, before you kind of leap to what is the way to get there. What you need is a bus system that is more affordable, more reliable, that, that knits into the key modes and the interchanges, that doesn't compete with or undermine Metrolink, um, that serves all areas, doesn't just sort of over-concentrate on the lucrative routes. That's what we need from a reformed bus system. You know, modern fleet, audio-visual announcements on it, full disability access. We know what we need, single livery, actually, mm -hmm. because I, I kind of feel if you, you know, we've got to aim to be world-class, haven't we? If you arrive at Manchester Airport, you want a transport system that kind of looks coherent, it looks easy to use. We are moving towards not just reforming buses, but we're looking at a GM taxi standard, so all taxis in GM being the same livery and same standard. We think that's the step up that Greater Manchester needs to make now mm -hmm. if it is to be what we believe it can be, which is in that kind of top group of world cities that has a transport system to match. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, does anyone have a question for either of the mayors into a microphone? Um, one to this gentleman here and then I will come to you. Thank you. North, Northwest Business Leadership Team. Um, I, I'm sure you're aware that in France over the last 25 years, uh, uh, 30 light rail schemes have been got off the ground uh, through the, the Versament Transport, the local transport tax. Do you think that the key to moving progress in the north of England is to have a local transport tax? Local transport tax. Andy, hmm. first. I was hoping he was going to... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll oh, do you go that first, yeah. Yeah. Um, You can take the fall. Why don't we have one in London? Why is it always us that we have to do things that we wouldn't ask people down south to do now. Um, central government should be giving us an equal share of transport funding and it was said today, wasn't it, again by uh, the Secretary of State that we're getting all these things. But if you have a look at it, we're still per capita well behind what they get in London per capita. So no, I, I think there should be some um, equity in the way things are distributed. And again, again, one of your panel were talking about Green Book um, and without going into the details of that, that is so important to areas like ours where we can't always prove the BCR, um, but we know that if we did something, that that would be the catalyst for huge regeneration. Again, because of the Jubilee land, they didn't prove the, the business case there. It happened and look at the, um, the huge transformation. Well, we can do that as well and we just need the government yeah. to start to genuinely want to rebalance the economy. I think, um, just to agree with what Steve's saying, I mean, it, it kind of was tried here, if you remember, a decade ago. Um, Greater Manchester was promised a pack package of investment if we accepted a tax or a congestion charge. And the public resoundingly rejected it. I think for the reason Steve is, is giving, but maybe, maybe for a couple more. You know, it's not fair to put in a charge where many people have no alternative but to use their car. So when the congestion charge came to London, th there was alternatives, wasn't there? You could go on over, you, you had good quality public transport. To bring in something like that before people have got the means to escape it isn't fair, I, I don't think. But then that's the second point. London never had a tax, a local tax, years ago when it was getting all of that investment to build the tube system and the, uh, and, and the bus network, etc. So, you know, we're just... We're not at that point, you know, I think we need a point of major long-term government investment. And this is the key message I would want to get over today. Please, let's stop talking about as though HS2 solves the North or Northern Powers Rail solves the North. It really doesn't. It, it, it is part of the solution we need, but it's also about substantial funding for city regional transport and powers in the next 10 to 15 years. It's all of it. And that is basically getting what London has had over decades uh, that, that we have never had. If you then build your economy on the back of that and you give people genuine alternatives to the car because of that investment, then maybe you could look at the, the solution you're suggesting later down the line. But I think that would be decades down the line, to be honest with you. Because uh, effectively, you know, you, the idea that you kind of have to tax the North to pay for stuff, whereas you know, that investment was put in from, uh, from government coffers years ago, well, the inequality of that would be, would be massive if we went down that path. Thank you. Uh, we had another question here, and can I also get Slido up on the screen? Is there another gentleman somewhere who wants to ask a question? Oh, one here anyway. Uh, 
Hi, Alan White from Waits. This question is to Andy. Um, the multimodal transport system is a great idea, and other major cities in the world, which you could argue are world class, they all have one. Realistically, when would you like to see it in place? And if you do get your wish and it happens, what would you call it? <laughs> um, so, uh, how long would it take to, um, to deliver? I, um, I think you could do it within five to seven years, something like that. I mean, I wouldn't want to over-claim, you know, because there's no point, is there? You know, reforming the bus system will take some time. Uh, delivering GM rail will take some time. Uh, maybe it's safer to say within 10 years, I don't know. But rather than it looking like it's, oh, it's all far off, and what I want to map out is that's where we want to get to, but then here's a series of steps that we can take now to start moving us towards that. So we went zonal on Metrolink this year. And I see a question on Slido about quick wins. Well, that was a quick win for some people because it's given more for the traveling public from a, a zonal system. We're going to go contactless on Metrolink very soon. So that's another kind of ingredient of that type of system. Um, we've got a free bus pass for 16 to 18 year olds coming in in September. So we're kind of, do you see what I mean? We're building, building, building. Um, what would we call it? Um, I don't know, actually. My, um, um, my other half suggested we should call the free bus pass for uh, 16 to 18 year olds um, the buzz pass. Um, obviously, a link to the Manchester B there, but obviously, if you come from Wigan or Bolton, you kind of call it that anyway. And, uh, <laughs> it was a joke that was lost on the rest of Greater Manchester, so uh, it's not, it's not going to be called the buzz pass. So, uh, but I think what I've got to do first before I call it anything. I'm really keen, what I keep calling it our equivalent of the tube map, but I'm going to publish that ne next month. Do you know what I mean? Do you, I want people in Greater Manchester to see a map that connects the different modes and kind of starts to make people think about how you might hop on those different modes to do different journeys. Because at the moment here, I think people tend to be loyal to one mode. Oh, I get in by rail and I go all the way in by rail, or I go in by car, I go in by Metrolink. And it's because of the nature of the way the system is kind of run and charged for that people think in that way. What we've got to get them to is, I'll do that bit by a, one of Chris Borman's bike hire, I'll do that bit by a bus and that bit by Metrolink, and it will all be capped, so therefore I'll be able to afford it. Do you, do you see where I'm coming from? And it's quite a big shift, I think, for the GM system. If you've got any ideas of a, of a name for it that, that's better than the one I've come up with, then please let me know. Get, it, get in touch with them on Twitter. Yeah, sorry? Oh, okay, well, that's <laughs> um, Steve, I'm going to roll two questions uh, into one for you uh, on Slido. So one that Andy's already spotted. So um, lots of positive noises, seemingly little benefits on the ground. What quick wins can you deliver in the next 12 months? Which also leads on partly to the second question. Should the tenure for mayors be extended <laughs> to allow oh, yes. more time for you to I deal with these issues? I think ten-year terms feels about <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure about the second. I, I, I think we should be accountable and, and be able to even though this one was only three years, and it is the first time ever that we've had any sort of regional governance in this country, the most centralised political democracy in the OECD. Um, in two years' time, sorry, in two years that we've been here, I think we can both point to things. I can point to a, a whole host of, of things, transport and transport connected and totally separate to transport. That wouldn't have happened if we hadn't had a metro mayor in the Liverpool city region. The, the very fact that I said before, we've got six districts working together to plan for the future. The, the station commission that we said, you know, tidal power that we'll bring um, on shore, um, digital connectivity, but on transport, um, the lowest tunnel tolls since 1992. We took it down to a one pound for a fast tag in the Liverpool city region. Um, stuff on buses, half price travel for our apprentices. There's loads of things that we can point to that we've done. Yeah. Um, but if we had, and it's not power for power's sake, honestly it's not, but we're doing things despite the fact that we've got a lack of powers, real powers, and we have decentralization and not real devolution. Real devolution is saying to me and him and whoever else, you stand on a platform and this is the budget that goes with it and you spend it how you want and the people of Greater Manchester or the Liverpool City region in a time frame of four years, whenever, they will decide whether you've spelt it appropriately, spent that money appropriately. You've, what missed, the, you've missed off the list the major revamp of Newtley Willows train station, my local oh, train station. That, that was just for you, though. Is, 
doing a very good job in bringing a lot more commuters into Greater Manchester. So I, I love the fact that Andy for, goes uh, past a plaque huh. every day to the train station <laughs> with my name on it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think the big, sweet. the big uh, transport investment that everyone's on tenterhooks to hear about as well, Steve, is are you bringing back Liverpool's monorail? Oh, my... This is... Um, do you know when you say something as a throwaway comment? We, uh, <laughs> like um, I said, we shouldn't be confined to the thinking that's previously gone on. We, we should think outside the box. And, you know, what about a monorail, for instance, just, you know, thinking outside the box? Um, the journalists got hold of it. Liverpool's getting a monorail. And so you've got to be very, very careful. Hang on, so it was her fault, not your <laughs> no, fault. No, no, it was the, it, exactly yeah, the yeah. echo. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm really interested in flying cars, just to let you know uh, for the headline. Um, but uh, but we, we genuinely can point to things um, that we have done, but just on those powers. So, for instance, if we're going to, I'd love to have had the opportunity to ask Chris this, if he's going to do all these wonderful things, all these infrastructure that we're, uh, we're, we're going to do everything, we're building millions of houses and we're going to do rail projects and we're going to do everything else, who's going to do them? Because the government aren't giving us the flexibilities around the apprenticeship levy to actually train people for the future for when these projects come online. And you need a lead-in period because these people need to have the right skills for those jobs. And this is the, the problem with a lack of joined-up government. If we had the powers, we would do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, just coming to a question here on, on Slido, the second one. So, I sit here, I want to use more public transport, but can't be a mum with three school drop-offs to do and have a career. Yeah. What do you think when you hear that, Andy? If you want oh, to I relate to it, because I, you know, I still do the school run before I come into to here. So I do the school run, then off and go to Newton Willows train station. I can get a park there now. Your kids are 24, 27, <laughs> 29. <laughs> <laughs> not quite, not quite. <laughs> Um, the reason I do it, though, and, and increasingly use the train is because you can now get a car park. But I think, you know, if I'm picking up on the question there, it's, it's often the unreliability of public transport that means people can't do that, can they? They can't, you know, manage all of those pressures and then, you know. So I, I um, you know, I, 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 I kind of feel we've got to start more, more local level. So mum with um, three school drop-offs, it's why I've invested in cycling and, and walking so heavily in, with the work that Chris Boardman is doing. 50% of kids in the Netherlands cycle to school. It's 2% here. I can't remember, the figure Chris quotes it a lot. Someone from TF Gem will help me out if I've forgotten it. In Greater Manchester every year, have I got it right? There's 200 million journeys that are less than one kilometre by car. I think I've got that right, haven't I? Sorry? 180. 180, I'm corrected. But think about that. You know, we are, we are a car, we've built for the car over decades, haven't we? We've kind of constructed everything in that way, the mm. drop off, everything. I think we do, you know, we're all talking big transport schemes here today. You know, to the mum who does the three drop offs, surely we should be building dedicated, safe cycle paths towards our schools so that kids can get the physical activity benefit. We're not clogging the cars, the roads with cars. We're making it easier and st less stressful for families to get around in the morning. Cleaner air. Cleaner air. So, you know, we gave, it was, a, I'm sure maybe some people kind of raised an eyebrow at this, but I did decide through the Transforming Cities to give Chris Boardman and his team a budget of 160 million pounds. And he's building out the B network now. I, I think from a development point of view, the value that will be added to communities through that is probably bigger than any massive amount of money you might spend on one train station or one thing, you know. I think you've got to get, you've got to, we've got to think differently in this country. We've got to stop building for the car. Mm -hmm. We've got to stop building more higher density development closer to public transport. Uh, and that is a change that we've tried to embody through our spatial framework. But to be honest, I think we could go even further. But, but it's a, a cultural shift as well, isn't it? Because um, I haven't spent some time as, as a, an MP like Andy in London. Um, you have late night sittings and you get out of the, the commons and Lords would be getting on buses and the cleaners would be getting on, and everybody would get on the bus. And it's not seen in the same light. Certainly in the Liverpool City region, I don't know about Manchester, seems some people think that that's the poor mode of transport. And we need everybody to, to see the vast improvements that there are on our bus network. We've got the, um, the youngest, if you like, bus network um, outside of London. Uh, no buses are seven years or older. 
We've just um, ordered 25 hydrogen-powered buses. Most of ours are, um, are dual-powered, um, ele electric or, or electric diesel or whatever. Um, but we're, we're moving the fleet on, and they really are attractive. We've got leather seats, wi um, Wi-Fi connectivity, um, charging points, on a tellies. Lot. It's completely different than the old rattlers that you used to get on when you were a kid. Um, these, these are they're like coaches, mm -hmm. and but uh, it's still um, seen that's for younger people or for what we call the twirlies. Um, that's the people who have the bus pass because we have the most generous concessionary travel scheme in the whole country. Andy, um, at 60, <laughs> at 60 in the Liverpool City region, you get um, a bus pass, but you can't use it until half nine. Mm -hmm. So when the bus pulls up at 25 past, the, um, the old people say, too early. So they, these things are called the, the twirlies. That's, mm -hmm. genuine, that's a genuine story. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't invent that. That's what it's called. Well, so these I've things are called twirlies. I've learned something new today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, too early. Fabulous. Well, uh, one last per, uh, question here then on uh, Slido. So Grayling earlier was saying that expenditure on transport per head in, was more in the north than mm. in the south because TfL and Crossrail don't count. Uh, whereas Rotherham, you've said uh, it's far below. So how can two opinions be vastly different and who is right? Mark Twain said, lies, damn lies, <laughs> <and> statistics. <laughs> um, uh, well, I, I just, I, I, it, it, is that what he said? Sorry. Yeah, he did. Sorry, he said, oh, it, it, <laughs> you guys should have been here earlier. The Southerners, that's you? what he said. You, you're joking. It's three to one, uh, at least. Um, all the independent assessments say, for every pound what? that we get, the South gets three. <laughs> He said he's spending more per head on transport in the north. Ah! Oh my God! Oh. What period are you talking about? You know what? I didn't ask him. No, we should have done <laughs> well, that probably cannot, this week. Well, let's just be clear. It's it's not right. So uh, no, it's not right. It's it, it, it's very wrong, actually. Right. Well, that's probably <laughs> a, a good good note to end on. One final point from both of you, then. Uh, kind of one one call to Grayling or to government. What do you want uh, for Greater Manchester, Andy? It, it, it's our turn, is what I would say, and. You know, I'm really clear about this. You know, I've laid it out. You know, I know what we need in the next five to seven years. Maybe that's too optimistic. Let's call that the next 10 years, the city regional investment, the, the London-style commuter system. So people can see that. Let's stop this debate about HS2 versus Northern Powers Rail. It's both. Let's just accept that. It's north, south, and it's, and it's west, uh, east. Uh, that's got to come as well. We have to, I saw a comment about the, the Audsall Cord there. There's got to be investment to finish that, the Castlefield Corridor, the Trans-Pennine upgrade. This is my worry about where we are with Heathrow Airport expansion. You know, it's, it's, it's odd to me a little bit, if I could say this, Jessica, about HS2 becoming public enemy number one when it comes to transport uh, investment. It's a public transport scheme at the end of the day. It might be expensive and it might need to be refocused, as the House of Lords Committee has said today. I accept all of that. But why are we kind of attacking a public transport scheme when there's a third runway being proposed down at Heathrow, which will have a knock-on of about 20 billion extra public transport investment to service that expanded airport? But don't forget that, by the way. That traps. It's that old thing that Steve was saying about more going to more. If you put more in London and South East, you have to keep adding more to service that bigger facility. If you're going to build HS2 through Birmingham Airport or Manchester Airport, does anyone in this room seriously think it would be right to go ahead with a third runway at Heathrow now? I'd, I don't personally. And I think this is the mindset shift. You, you asked me what we need, Jessica, so let me answer it this way. This talk of Northern Powerhouse now has to become real. If you really mean it, you have to put us to the front of the queue for the next 30 years when it comes to building out transport on every level across this great north of England, linking the cities, giving us what we need to get about our own cities, but then linking the cities together. You cannot do it on the cheap. It's got to be a national drive to do it. It will take a lot of money over many years, but it's got to be done with the same determination that transport in London was built in the 20th century. You have to do the same for the north in the 21st century. And it's got to be made the, the top priority for the country, not a begging bowl, not a project here, a project there, the whole lot of it has to be done. And that is what I've, I'm afraid I've come to the conclusion that we, that we need. Thank you. Steve? Um, I think we're doing what we can do with the limited powers that we've got in our own areas. Um, West East connectivity is absolutely essential. 
It means, for instance, that we shrink journey times between Liverpool, Manchester Airport and Manchester City Centre to 22, 23 minutes. Um, it'll give people a choice, won't it? Because then they could decide if they wanted to, to you know, live in one area and go and work in another, like you know, live in Liverpool, go and work in Manchester, and then you can go over, right, can't you, to somewhere with culture. Um, <laughs> now, now, guys. Don't tweet that out. <laughs> I was only, I Manchester's got plenty. I, I did say that once, and then he went, we've got Oasis, and we've got, oh, no, yeah, we've got the Beatles. Um, <laughs> top trumps, isn't it? No, it, but genuine, we could, and, and if you think about that, it, that will have a knock-on effect on the type of housing that we'll need in, in areas, and that's why you do start to need to work together for the people in the northwest, and then we're trying to build them alliances right the way across the north, the northern corridor, 16 million people. Um, it, just give us the opportunity to do things. We'll do it better than you, Chris. And you'll always be welcome in the home of the Premier League champions. I don't take offence. So. <laughs> right, before it starts, before it starts getting a bit brutal up on stage, I think that's a good time to end the day. So please join me in thanking both Andy and Steve. <laughs> Thanks a lot.